I'm a UX writer at Google. I've been doing this for about eight years. I had no UX experience when I started, um, but I've learned a lot as part of a design team um, on Android. Um, anyway, this is what I'm going to talk about today. If I can, here we go. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about how I used to handle terminology and style 30 years ago in book publishing and give you a taste, a little bit of a taste of how, how we're handling similar issues today at Google. Um, and of course, any big project like this in a big organization like Google faces what we like to call the coordination headwind. And so I'm going to introduce um, some of the key factors that make up this headwind at Google. Um, sometimes the goal of improving content quality seems about as far away as the moon. So I'm going to say something about how Google moonshots work. And I'll end up uh, with some of the highlights going through our uh, kind of overview of our history over the last five years, getting Acklinks off the ground at Google. So I've got to use two hands at once here. Um, 1989. This is part of a style sheet that I created for a book um, about San Francisco Chinatown, as it happened. My wife and I used to run a, a book production service for book publishers. This was one of our projects. The style sheet consisted of an 11 by 17 piece of paper folded in half. I printed out my initial editorial decisions, big decisions here, you know, about you know, how we're going to de deal with uh, um, plurals and, and commas and things like that. Um, and this physical copy was shared by all the people in the production process, from copy edited manuscript through galleys. Remember galleys, anybody? Uh, page proofs, blue lines. And so this single piece of paper traveled with the product, basically, through the production process. And as you can see, people would make notes along the way about things that needed to be tracked that you know I hadn't noticed in the first place. So um, in those days, editors just like today, editors love to correct other editors' mistakes. <laughs> and um, as you can see, my original style sheet had a few problems, uh, which the copy editor was happy to point out. So uh, this was the book. Um, and this kind of style sheet, this process, worked great in those days. All the book publishers I worked for had some, some similar system. And of course, they all, they all had their own house style. So this, the copy editing style sheet uh, reflected the house style, and plus all the things that were special to a particular book. Some of you may recognize this illustration from another Acklings conference a few years ago. Um, obviously, today, with corporate content, paper style sheets won't scale. And at Google, we produce a huge quantity of content of many different kinds across many different teams. UI strings, which I work on, help articles, developer documentation, blog posts, marketing, internal HR material, and so on. And at Google, Content is highly decentralized. We have no content, central content organization. We have thousands of writers working in hundreds of different internal groups. Each group has its, different, its own traditions, its own culture, to some degree, its own processes and priorities. Writers are siloed by content type, product area, and to some extent, the sort of tribal history of their different groups. And of course, all of these different types of content coming from all these different groups contribute to Google's voice the brand, the personality that you imagine when you're looking, when you're dealing with Google products. So of course, um, human beings are social animals. We're highly sensitive to the nuances of language. A big part of our brain is devoted to language. We tend to make assumptions about who people are based on the way they speak. So your customers will imagine a personality for your company, whether you plan for it or not. And so our challenge has been, you know, how do we get, how do we get a handle on this? Um, so here's a cartoon that makes light of these challenges. This is a recent New Yorker cartoon. There's a young man on a date. I don't know if you can see it there, but um, he's explaining, I brought my editor along in case my stories start going nowhere. Well, corporate content is not only about first impressions. It has a huge role in determining how customers feel about their company throughout their lives. Unfortunately, editors are becoming almost as rare in big companies as they are on first dates. But the need for thoughtful use of language has only become more urgent. So let's face it, language skills still tend to be undervalued in big organizations. But they're more important than ever. So how do we apply these kinds of skills today? So fast forward now from 1989 to 2015. Um, at that point, UX writers 
which were actually a new discipline at Google. We, we were, used to be considered tech writers, but it, around this time, as I'll explain in a bit, um, we came up with a sort of job definition for a UX writer. But we were basically using that same paper style sheet, only it was in a spreadsheet. Um, we collected UI terms and a few style notes kind of randomly in this alphabetical word list used by multiple teams. It was stored in a spreadsheet. There was a committee that was supposed to be managing it. But as time went by, and Google, you know, Android particularly expanded dramatically during these years, we couldn't keep up with the specialized UI requirements for different teams, which started, so everybody started developing their own word list. This master list sort of began to get stale. It wasn't being kept up. People still used it, but in a way, that just added to the confusion. So obviously, this was not scalable. Um, and then we also had, on the style side of things, uh, as these different U UX writing teams started to develop, um, you know, their own style guidelines for different use cases and different products. Um, th oftentimes, these, these style guidelines would start out with a lot of enthusiasm. People needed to recognize they had a need, put a lot of energy into it, but over time, they became encrusted with comments and suggestions for updates, often didn't, and, and these things never got addressed in, in many cases. So this, these guidelines also have started to get scale, stale. We ended up with a forest of contradictory guidelines in varying states of disrepair that were impossible for one read, writer to keep up with. And if you were new to Google, you were trying to learn how the, what the style was, it was a, an incredible challenge. It was basically impossible. Some of these documents are around today, and Acrolinks has definitely helped but it's only part of the solution. Uh, we also need better channels of communication across teams, more scalable governance processes. There's a lot of work besides the tools that needs to be done um, to scale. So obviously, Acrolinks provides a much different model than those folded pieces of paper we used to pass around. Um, so how has Acrolinks helped us at Google? Um, so I'm gonna leave the style issues aside now and just talk about terminology, word lists. So the go slash in this, um, uh, on this slide is what we call at Google a go, go link. I th I'm sure a lot of other companies have things similar. It's basically just a short link. This particular link opens a word list hosted in Acrolinks for terms that are used the same way across all Google's 100,000 employees. Now this simple link was the result of a year's worth of work. Um, starting around 2016, a few of us presented the word list committee that still sort of existed with a new challenge. Which words in their spreadsheet should be used the same way across the company, not just for UI strings, but wherever they appeared, and which kinds of usage were relevant only in the UX world, only in the design world? So after much painstaking work, we separated the Google-wide terms from the UI-specific terms, and using Acrolinks, we were able to create one list for all of Google, which you can find internally here, and uh, anybody can type this into their browser and, and get, uh, get this uh, uh, set of terms. We also, we separated out the UI specific terminology. Um, these are things that did not apply across the company but were important for, for uh, product design. Uh, for example, uh, in UI writing at Google, we like to, we try to avoid the terms enabled or disabled in favor of things like turn on or turn off. It's you know, more sort of natural language, which is fine for UI writing, but enable and disable are totally normal words in the developer world. So our guidance for these terms was limited to this, this particular list. And then we were able to combine these two lists because a UX writer needs to know both, right? They need to know both what the Google-wide terminology is and the things that are specific to, their, uh, to, the, to the interface. And so we were able to combine these two different lists in the Go Google UX words, which is now widely used um, across the company, but by, not just by writers, but by uh, product managers, designers, engineers. Um, uh, particularly the Android Enterprise uh, group, which I'm, uh, I've done some work with, uh, has really had a lot of success um, creating their own specialized list, um, which you can see in this. We've got these various common, there's a lot more than is shown here, but um, these are the various Go links that we have for different combinations of lists or different specific lists unique to a given use case. So. Um, this was a huge step forward. Just having the word lists organized in this way so that you could sort of mix and match the terminology that was relevant to your particular uh, uh, use case it was, it was really helpful. And of course, um, when it comes to um, using the sidebar, you've got to have this kind of terminology in place. 
um, in order to, to uh, um, you know, uh, run your checks on a given document. So there's a lot of teams using the sidebar for, uh, uh, with, mostly with Google Drive, to check both terminology and style as, in real time as they're work, working. And of course, since these different teams have very different use cases, different combinations of terminology, different style requirements, we've, got a, we've developed a bunch of um, checking profiles. Um, and so each profile includes customized terminology, writing guides, complexity levels, and so on for a given use case. The checking profiles are really critical to the way we use Acrolinks at Google. There are three main ways we're using Acrolinks today. Um, one is the sidebar, of course, which allows individual writers to run Acrolinks at any time while they're writing. Um, the content analyzer, the bulk checking tool, allows writing teams to track quality for an entire corpus of published documents. And then the um, uh, Acrolinks API is being used by the Google, Google Cloud Tech Pubs team to generate a report automatically every time a writer stages a document for review, they get a report back with uh, the issues specific to that use case. What do we do about the immune response? So what do I mean by an immune response? Well, as we know, any kind of enterprise software has to be highly flexible, it has to be customizable. Standing up, maintaining, and updating complex software like Acrolinks involves an ongoing commitment from IT, from management, from the people who are using it. But at Google, in addition to these sort of normal challenges of enterprise software, we have some additional issues that are specific to our culture and the way we work. Writers tend to be siloed, as I mentioned. We don't have a, we don't have a central content organization. Uh, processes, workflows, um, schedules, all many different aspects of our work across different writing teams, not just UX, are changing all the time and very dramatically even from one UX team to another, let alone from one different kind of writing group to another. And most importantly, Google has extremely uh, rigorous requirements for third-party software when it comes to security, network issues, and privacy. And of course, these uh, requirements are also changing all the time. As one of the engineers at Android told me when I was describing some of our problems with uh, getting Acrolinks adopted, deploying third-party software at Google generates an immune response. The Google organism rejects foreign tissue. So how do you find, how do you get time? How do you get funding and support for an AI-based platform, which is what Acrolinks is, that's not invented at Google? Believe me, it's been a challenge. So I mentioned the coordination headwind. There's a PM at Google, Alex Komorowski, uh, who's put a lot of thought into analyzing these kinds of obstacles that we face. Um, his collective term for this kind of thing is the coordination headwind. It's not just about the problems involved in, in third-party software, deploying third-party software. He's talking about really any complex project that involves collaboration across multiple teams in a big organization. So let's look at a few of his slides from an internal presentation he put together on this subject. I think this is the first time that uh, this has been shown publicly. So we're going to talk about... Um, uh, the components of the headwind, and, and, and these, these vary depending on the type of organization you're dealing with. So organizations come in many different types and work very differently depending on where they fall on this scale between a bottom-up organization and a top-down organization. So a military is a canonical extreme example of a top-down organization. Uh, you have a rigid and formal hierarchy. People give commands at the top, and they filter down, and people execute, uh, you know, follow their orders, in theory. Now, a bottom-up, the, the, at the other extreme, uh, the canonical ex example of a bottom-up organization is slime mold. You have a number of uh, independent actors, brainless amoeba, basically, making individual decisions, leading to complex emergent behavior of the colony. And slime mold is actually pretty interesting. Uh, it's been studied extensively. You, this is actually an, uh, 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 an example of how you can use slime mold and the way it makes collective decisions to derive the way the Tokyo Rail Network optimizes its connections. So slime mold's not all bad. Okay, so obviously these two extremes have different properties, some good, some not so good. There's a spectrum between them. Most organizations fall somewhere in the middle. A typical large corporation tends to be close to the top-down model. 
Google, on the other hand, stands out by being much closer to the bottom-up approach. This is actually a fundamental part of our culture. It's reinforced by the way we hire and promote people. We look for people who thrive on ambiguity. We reward independence and initiative and encourage Googlers to question authority. Now, I, this was not in Alex's slides, but I wanted to point out that even, even though grassroots effort like, efforts like Acrolinks are encouraged at Google, Google does have an organizational hierarchy. You can't produce software for two billion people without a huge bureaucracy. And questioning authority is never easy. Let's face it, people in authority don't like to be questioned, even at Google. OK, so even so, Google tends to resemble slime mold much more than it resembles a military. Of course, this type of organization, the, the type of organization, is only one factor. Um, I've already discussed some of the other problems we face. Alex has a lot more to say about these, but I'm just going to summarize his main points. Um, so first of all, everybody has much, too much to do. You hear this complaint all the time. It doesn't matter if you're working for a corporation, a university, a small business, a nonprofit, government, any kind of organization, everybody's overloaded. And for writers, this problem is exacerbated because we have to wear so many hats. We have to be technical experts, content experts, interface experts, writers, editors, proofreaders, psychologists sometimes, especially in the, in the UI world. And at many companies, the distinct roles that you existed and perhaps still exist in the publishing industry tend to merge into one so-called content strategist role, which covers a lot of uh, a multitude of sins. Um, so deploying enterprise software requires collaboration, obviously, across many teams. And each team has its own history, its own tribal priorities and culture and so on, and style, terminology, tools and workflows tend to differ dramatically. Um, and then, of course, um, uncertainty is a huge factor. Uh, technical infrastructure is always changing. Reorgs happen all the time. It's difficult to tell in advance what problems will arise or how long they'll take to solve with any given project. Governance, funding, bandwidth are all hard to predict in terms of what you're going to need down the road. You just don't know what you're getting into a lot of times with a big new project. So we got a lot of obstacles. Attempting to get something like Acrolinks off the ground at Google is really difficult. Now, Acrolinks may not be as sexy as some of Google's more daring moonshots like self-driving cars, but from my point of view, getting it deployed at Google is a kind of moonshot. It's an ambitious goal that has met many unexpected obstacles. So here are a few more slides from Alex's uh, coordination headwind presentation um, about moonshots. So the first thing is, you've got to be wary of moonshots that are unnecessarily executed as a straight shot to the moon. Moonshots are good. They get us to think really big. They encourage creative solutions. And for some types of project, that might be the only way. But if they're tackled as one straight shot, they often have huge risk factors and take nearly impossible amounts of effort to succeed. So often there's a better way. The better way is to sight off the moon, but handle execution differently. Work with the team. Now, this is Alex's uh, uh, advice. Work with the team to rigorously develop a low-resolution picture of a future three to five years from now that can plausibly reach its destination with no miraculous leaps along the path. This is your moon. Now, just an aside here. This is not something I did myself. I wish I had. Um, it's a really good idea because it really took us a long time to get a picture of what the future would look like. But ideally, you have some idea where you're going. Now you sight off the moon. You find the roof shot that's a no-brainer that clearly adds up to short-term value greater than the expected cost. And it gets you in the right direction. So your roof shot should be as small as possible or as, as reasonable for your problem. In some cases, it might be more of an Eiffel Tower shot, but you, know, you get the idea. Um, these reduce the risk factors to a much more manageable size. Once you've accomplished the roof shot, you've locked in the value, giving you a stable foundation for the next one and also giving you increasing momentum. And then you repeat again and again and again. It won't be the most efficient path, and that's OK. Each individual step is minimal cost, but the value accretes. And before you know it, you've accumulated huge value that leads to a much bigger outcome than the sum of its parts. 
Um, and if you hadn't sighted off the moon, you would have done a series of roof shots that didn't add up to much, a random walk. And believe me, we got sidetracked a few times with Acrolinks. But if you hadn't done um, iterative roof shots, the risk factors would have led to project failure. We learned this the hard way. There have been times, for sure, when we tried to do far too much at once. The idea is that if you do iterative roof shots that sight off the moon, you get the best of both worlds. Okay, so how did this actually work for us? Um, I'm gonna take you through a very quick history of the Acrolinx moonshot at Google. Uh, so we'll start by listing some of the key tactical goals, which we should have had at the beginning, but we, uh, we have developed over the years. Um, these are actually pretty straightforward, I think, um, and they're tactical, they're not about business goals, they're just like, how do, we, how do we make this happen? So we will have reached the moon when, number one, every Googler has access, access, not required, but access, to an on-demand guidance that helps them apply appropriate tone, style, and terminology for the content they produce. Now, we can't force anybody to use Acrolinks at Google. It has to prove itself one team at a time. But in order to, for a new team to try it, they've got to have access. It's got, it's got to be there for them, right? So um, it's also important to have onboarding governance and analytics processes that are clearly documented with relevant training available when you need it. Obviously, you've got to have ongoing support. Once somebody decides that this is for them and they want to use it, uh, every team at Google that chooses to use Acrolinks uh, and the related processes has to have a clear path for funding, onboarding, and support. And again, I'm not saying anything about business goals here. We can't take those for granted. We, it's, we, it's still a challenge to make the case for content quality. But continuing to make progress toward these tactical goals is a requirement if Acrolinx is to have any, any you know, significant impact on content quality across the company. Um, despite a big bureaucracy and complicated management chains, the program remains a bottom-up effort, a grassroots effort. Okay, so here's the timeline, more or less, um, over the last five years, in the middle of 2014 to today. Um, with one important exception, our deployment has been managed solely on a volunteer basis. We've received some critical management support, but the entire program has been driven by grassroots efforts, what we call at Google a 20% project. Now you'll see in 2016, 2017, we were able to get headcount for IT support. Um, CorpEng is what we call our internal uh, huge team that manages all Google's internal processes. Um, this is one exception to the 20% approach, and it was really critical. We really couldn't have got anywhere without this. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a second. So in 2014, I'd had a conversation with Andrew, and he slyly encouraged me to set up an Acrolinx test server under my desk. Um, and uh, it wasn't literally under my desk, but it might as well have been, because I'm, I'm not a server guy. I really don't know much about running something like this, but I managed to get it running, barely. Uh, we had no IT support but I was able to get some basic help from more knowledgeable teammates. I mean, I work with designers, with engineers, and I could kind of you know, go into their cubicle and say, well, how do, how do, what is this thing? You know, what, how do I make this happen? And occasionally, they would actually deign to help me <laughs> uh, with whatever the problem was. And in that, at, at that point in 2014, I was part of the, I still am basically part of the Android design team, although it's much bigger and more split up now. Android was expanding rapidly and finding ways to create consistent designs across multiple platforms and surfaces was a huge priority. This included consistency across interface text in multiple products. And so our leadership in, in the Android design world um, recognized that Acrolinx had potential for UX, but it also had potential beyond design. And they agreed to give us some funding to get it off the ground as long as the other teams that were gonna benefit from it also chipped in. This was actually the beginning of a long nightmare, but <laughs> I'll get to that, um, in terms of collecting money from all these different teams. Um, so we got, but at the beginning we got a few funds, from, uh, we got the consumer help writing team who were quite interested, and the localization team to chip in along with the material UX team that gave us the initial funding. So that was 2014, just kind of barely getting, it, getting the server working. It was pretty slow just a couple of people playing around with the software when we had a chance. But by 2015, a few of us had figured out enough to start a small deployment. It was mostly help writers. Um, we didn't have a lot of time to spend on it, 
uh, we were kind of all doing it on the side. So we got a, a, about 20 help writers in the, in the consumer support organization to start using Acrolinks on real work in production help articles. And at this point, I learned one of the key rules about deploying Acrolinks. Whenever you introduce Acrolinks to a team of writers, you'll find that they can be roughly divided into three groups. About a third of them love it. They get it right away. They know that it helps them improve their own writing. They use it uh, frequently. No problem. And then you have the middle third who don't exactly get it, but they will use it, and they like the fact that they might start out running it and they get a score of you know, 60 or something, and then after a while their score goes up. They maybe get 80. And they, the, the sort of game aspect of the, of the software appeals to them, so they actually do use it. And then you have about a third of the writers who are basically suspicious. They don't get it. They basically are grumpy. They tell you, go away, don't bother me. I don't want a machine telling me how to write. So this is something that I've seen again and again as new teams deploy. It's, it's something you have to expect. It's something you have to be prepared to deal with. It's, uh, you know, you want to try to shift people at least into the middle group, if not the, the, the group of enthusiasts. So um, there were three teams involved at this point, uh, Android UX, which was basically me, the consumer help writers, and the partner help writers. Uh, it was really these help writers who got the most benefit initially, because at that point, we didn't really have any easy way to run Acrolinks against strings produced by UX writers like me. But we still had a lot of technical problems. We couldn't use Acrolinks at home or on the Google shuttles or at a conference like this. You know, if I wasn't in the office, I couldn't use it. Um, uh, and we had to start figuring out how to train these new people and the new leads who were starting to get involved for, for these slightly different use cases. We create, had to create the terminology domains I talked about. We had to sort, sort out disagreements. In other words, we had to come up with some kind of governance model. So I started meeting regularly with the leads um, from these different teams to address some of these issues. So let's look a little more closely at the leads group. Who are these people contributing 20% of their time? Why are they willing to do that for a project with so many technical problems and such an uncertain future? Well, this has to do with Google and, and the, the Google culture. At least in the design world at Google, we are encouraged to risk our time on new projects or new ideas. That is, if we see some problem area of a product or a process that nobody else is paying attention to, and we think we know a potential solution, we're encouraged to risk some portion of our time to pursue that idea or vision. In reality, a 20% project can occupy from anywhere from a few hours a week to a couple of days a week, depending on what's needed and, of course, on the, your, the responsibilities in your day job. I mean, if you have to ship you know, the next version of Android, Acrolinks is going to take a, a, a you know, second place for a while. Uh, but some of us really felt that, we had, that the, the product had huge potential at Google. And our managers, this is really important, our managers were willing to let us risk our time on what was basically a hunch. Another important in, um, event in 2015 was the launch of material design. Um, this consisted of guidelines, tools, public discussions, and design-focused R&D that has had a major impact on the software industry since then. You can look it up. Uh, there's a lot of information about material design on the web. It marked a fundamental shift in Google's collective attitude toward design disciplines, like interaction design, visual design, prototyping, research, and content strategy. The material design guidelines became a critical tool in developing more consistent visual and interaction design patterns, including UX writing style and terminology across all of Google's products. So there, there, were, there were a lot of uh, uh, aspects of material that really were important for us um, as writers. Um, so improving tools became a big focus. Of the, there was a whole part of the material design team that formed around this time devoted strictly to tools for, um, for designers. We also basically created the role of UX writer at this time. When I joined Google, I was considered a tech writer. I was not interviewed by any other writers. Um, uh, we didn't really, I had, not, I had never done any, anything resembling UX writing before. Um, so we did, uh, I was involved in helping create what we call at Google a job ladder, defining the different uh, aspects of the role and how you could get promoted and so on. And some of us uh, newly minted UX writers were deeply involved during the, the previous year, 2014, in developing the new material design guidelines. This is actually something I continue to work on. I work on Android Auto 
and we need to develop these very complicated design guidelines for auto manufacturers and developers who are writing apps to run in your car. Uh, and a lot of other teams have been uh, work on uh, have UX writers working on design guidelines as well. Um, so, as we began to consider how to apply these design guidelines across multiple teams, we also naturally began to think about well, how do we apply writing guidelines across the company, at least in the UX world. So it was interesting because Acrolinks now became a focal point for discussions among writing teams. Not just UX writers, help writers, developer writers, people working on various kind of uh, sort of specialized types of content all started getting involved. And in many cases, these writers had not had any kind of communication with each other previously. So it was interesting because Acrolinks provided a sort of forcing function to that drove us to start talking to each other in ways that we hadn't been before. Okay, so that's 2015. Uh, still a bit of a struggle, but we were making progress. Um, and again, it was all something we were doing with one hand. But in 2016, as I alluded to earlier, we had this major milestone. We got support from CorpEng, from our IT organization. We got a single headcount from the material team. Again, they were betting on something that looked promising, even though we hadn't got a whole lot to show for it uh, so far. We got funding, basically, for a full-time Googler, or the equivalent of a full-time Googler, to work exclusively running our server. We immediately passed this headcount to our IT organization, to CorpEng. Uh, contrary to what I originally thought, we didn't get just one person. I, you know, I imagined a guy with a ponytail who would show up whenever there was a problem. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, we, we basically got the expertise of, expertise of an entire organization within CorpEng called AppOps, Application Operations. And so the security and network um, experts in AppOps started to examine our server setup, which was pretty primitive. Uh, they started meeting with the, some of the Acrolinks engineers and helped Acrolinks figure out how to meet Google's stringent requirements for this type of internal service. And of course, all of this took more time, including time spent by us 20 percenters. We had to coordinate engineering meetings, explain what we were trying to do, and it all went really slowly. Meanwhile, despite on, on, ongoing uncertainty, more writers began to hear about this. They began to see the, the, the benefits, and our pilot ex deployments started to expand. So we had several teams now. We still had just the one leads group. Um, sometimes it seemed like CorpEng was taking forever to get this thing stood up. And our 20% our leads, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes they only had you know, 5 or 10% time, realistically. We started getting complaints from writers because it took a long time to respond to their feedback. Uh, managers began questioning the value of the whole program. Lots of problems. But we kept going. We kept struggling along. Enough people were getting enough value from the product to justify the relatively small ongoing costs at this point. So 2017. After two and a half years of this off-again, on-again approach, things really started to take off at this point. Um, CorpEng launched our server in the spring of this year. And as soon as that happened, a bunch of our technical issues went away. Not all of them. Remember, technical infrastructure at Google is always changing, so these challenges basically never end. But we had the experts helping us. And everything was a lot more reliable as soon as they launched. You could use Acrolinks on the Google shuttles. You could use it at home. More teams started taking the program seriously and wanted to start kicking the tires. So with more users and fewer technical issues, governance became much more important. We had to start thinking about how we were going to get all these people from different teams to work together successfully. So the governance model started getting a little more complicated. Um, we were still running the whole thing as basically a Skunk Works project. Uh, we had about 10 t teams involved by the end of this year. They all had very different use cases, very different levels of commitment. Um, the green boxes in this diagram represent what we began to call our hubs. These were small groups of the leads who were sort of self-organized to address specific aspects of our deployment. So let's look at these four hubs and also Acrolinks Professional Services. Um, this was the year that we began to engage with Acrolinks, uh, the, the Acrolinks Customer Success Team on a regular basis. So first of all, the leads. We were now meeting about once a month. We had about a dozen people from different teams who functioned as a sort of informal clearinghouse for information and decisions um, related to the other hubs. Um, a couple of us had already been working with the CorpEng folks as they stood up the server, 
and we formed the uh, sysadmin hub, which coordinated gu guidance package updates, server upgrades, and other server customizations with our CorpEng partners. Uh, CorpEng is a big organization. It, it, believe me, it takes a lot of coordination and discussion to solve some of these issues. Um, and then we had this uh, terminology group that formed around this time. Really, it was the successor to that old wordless committee I mentioned. They be, except that they met every week and they had a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and they were dealing with the ongoing suggestions coming from the term browser users, uh, from everybody really, but, but including people who were only using the term browser, only looking things up. Um, and they also began helping new teams prepare their word lists for importing into the Acrolinx database. And they began working with localization, um, which is this, this circle on the right. Um, trying to get, because they, they had helped us with the original funding, and um, we wanted them to be able to take advantage of all this terminology that we were collecting in our database so that they could make sure they were, it was being translated properly. What I wanted to point out here is that it, th this group of GTEC leads, GTEC is the organization where all these support help writers uh, uh, work, they began self-organizing, managing their own terminology, training, and management reporting. Um, uh, you might say they formed their own slime mold colony. Then, of course, we also started engaging with Acrolinx more. Um, each hub consulted with the Acrolinx experts as needed, and this turned out to be quite a lot more complicated than we were expecting. Uh, not, not due to Acrolinx so much as to our, the, just the complexity of what we were trying to do inside Google. So now I'm gonna show you a few slides from some other teams that were using the, the tool at this time. Um, this, this, these slides are all from that, that uh, GTEC hub, the, the, the group of help writers who were kind of running their own show. Um, a lot of different teams were experimenting in different ways. This slide shows that th this particular group of writers were, identified more terminology and style issues, the green and orange bars, than anything else. Um, they found very few grammar or spelling issues, which are the blue and red bars. At the same time, they reported that the grammar and spelling flags were, pr were producing, a lot of times they just weren't relevant. They were, they were false flags, basically. So this was actually a really important lesson for us. There's always gonna be some false flags, but if you have too many, people will get turned off. And it turned out in, for this particular case that the, some of the grammar and spelling rules weren't identifying much that was important anyway, so we just started turning rules off. So um, uh, this might seem obvious, but it really took us a while to learn the lesson and apply it. Now, of course, in some cases, if you, if you really care about a particular rule, you can work with Acrolinx to make it work better for you, for your use case, but that can take a long time. Acrolinx can't catch everything, and the value of certain rules depends very much on the use case. So this was, this was an important lesson. We realized we had to do a lot more scrubbing and testing earlier in the process during the pilot stage and turn off rules that just weren't working very well. So reducing false flags was a critical part of reducing Google's immune response to Acrolinx. And there are a few more slides here. They used the content analyzer to check over 8,000 external documents. And of course, every document had a score associated with it. Um, they used statistical analysis of these bulk scores to identify abnormally low scores. And then they were able to co um, uh, coordinate these low Acrolinx scores with other types of information. So in this diagram, the blue dots indicate Acrolinx scores to the left or lower, to the right or higher. Um, the pink area represents page views per year for the low scoring documents. And by correlating low scores with things like page views or escalations, the help team was able to identify the legacy articles that were most in need of refreshing. They couldn't possibly rewrite all 8,000 articles, but they wanted to find the ones where the problems were. So that was all you know, interesting and useful. Um, experiments and pilots continued into 2018. Every team had ideas about customizing the tool for their own particular use cases. We really had a lot going on. Um, we were really starting to develop some roof shot momentum. Another major development this year uh, on the CorpEng side involved migrating our server setup to Google Cloud Platform. This is an internal requirement for CorpEng, which was migrating Google's internal services to our own commercial platform. And our server happened to be one of the first to go through this process. Luckily for us, this migration helped focus even more engineering attention on the program. CorpEng started helping us address nagging problems like vendor access, scheduling updates, 
and tweaks to the language servers that went beyond their original mandate. They, at first, they just said, we'll run your server. Everything else is your problem. They turned out to be a lot more helpful than that. So the problem was we couldn't keep up with our 20% you know, um, hub arrangement. We had a very cumbersome funding model, which created a lot of overhead and, and headaches. There were all these specialized use cases for new teams that were difficult to support consistently. So it got really hard to give everybody the support they needed to be successful. And things got even more complicated. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this diagram, but you can imagine. Things were pretty messy. There were a lot of uncertainties. However, by the end of 2018, we had deployed more key, uh, key terminology domains. We'd continued our work with localization to help them harvest new terms from our database. We created our own help center internally and a new hub of, of leads to manage it. We began developing an API integration for the Google Cloud Platform, which is actually launching in just a few weeks. Um, we were supporting deployments for about 15 teams at this point of various sizes. And we formed a program management hub, the, the PGM box at the top, to coordinate Acrolink services with Mike and his professional services team. Um, there was a lot going on. It was really hard for all of us on both sides to, to keep track of who was doing what and what kind of help they needed. But we were really stretched to the limit. In fact, at one point, we had to declare a moratorium on new deployments. Um, we had enough trouble just supporting our current deployments, let alone bringing in new people. At times, I felt like I was propping up a delicate house of cards that might collapse at any point. And yet, every team involved, at least the ones that kept going, and not every, it didn't work for everybody, but the ones who, who kept with it continued to get value from their deployments, each in a, in a somewhat different way. So where, are we, where does that leave us today? So we have about 15 teams, as I mentioned, ranging in size from dozens of writers to just two or three. We have about 100 users uh, using it on a regular basis. And we have another 30 or 40 people from teams that are new to the project who are engaged in some form of early testing, developing their word lists, trying to figure out what kind of checking profiles they need, and so on. And so I'll give you a quick look at how this breaks down uh, for the 15 teams that are actually deployed. The big blue chunk here, GUP support, that's what they call themselves now, the Google support organization. They're looking at ways to extend Acrolink's use to vendors who focus on specific products as part of a, an attempt to improve quality and reduce costs. Um, YouTube was one of the quickest and most successful onboardings yet, and it just started a few months ago. Um, so far, they're using Acrolink's mainly for knowledge base articles and related content. And I think Satinder is here somewhere. There she is. Satinder was the lead at Google for getting uh, YouTube deployed. And I'd really like you to, uh, I'd encourage you to talk to her about how it worked because um, it was really one of our most, uh, our smoothest deployments so far. We took all of Acrolinx's advice. <laughs> we did a, <laughs> we, we did, um, um, you know, we, we, they examined our content beforehand and, and, and helped Satinder and her team understand the kinds of terminology issues and style issues that, uh, that were apparent. Um, and they're, they're, they're making good progress today. I also mentioned the Android Enterprise team, the green slice up there, um, which has done some interesting work getting other people besides writers to use the tool, uh, using uh, the, the sidebar with slides, for example. PMs and designers often use Google Slides, and it's really helpful for them to be able to check um, work in progress. And the orange slice is the other teams involved, which are much smaller. And then, of course, we have a lot of teams uh, experimenting I mentioned Google Cloud. Uh, next month, about 100 of their tech writers are going to start receiving an Acrolinx report automatically every time they stage a new document for review before they publish it. Um, and then there are various other things. HR is very interested in terms of the content, the content for Googlers about benefits and so on. It's usually written by non-writers. So how do, we develop, how do we develop a checking profile that non-writers writing this kind of content will be able to use? So there's a lot going on. The whole pro program is gaining momentum. A lot more teams want to get involved, more than we can handle right now. So how are we going to deal with this going forward? How can we scale so that people get what they need? So we need to do several things to improve our governance model. First of all, we have to move to an enterprise licensing model. Up until now, every team has been buying their own individual licenses. This means that sometimes when I issue a PO for a bunch of teams, who want new licenses, I've got literally 25 different approvers, which is, a, it is it's just insane. 
Um, and so I'm the one who ends up tracking all this stuff, and it's just not, it's not going to keep going. Fortunately, uh, every now and again, we, the, the clouds part, and a ray of sunshine comes through, and things look promising. Uh, in this case, it was the search infrastructure UX team. Uh, they handle third-party tools for designers, primarily. I mentioned you know, before this has become a big deal in the last few years. They heard about what we were doing, and they volunteered to fund our enterprise license on an ongoing basis. So this was huge. And it, it seemed like it happened by accident. It wasn't totally by accident. I, I heard later sort of some of the discussions that went into it. But it, was, I, it wasn't something I felt like I made happen. It just the, the program had been around long enough, and people saw that it was uh, you know, valuable. And uh, the decision was made, well, we better, we better, just, you know, we better keep this going. Um, the professional services side is also uh, has also been a finance nightmare. I have to go around hat in hand collecting contributions from different teams. Uh, we put it into a central bucket, and Aquilink's professional services kind of draws on that as they, as they need to. And this became uns unsustainable for a bunch of reasons, including the fact that each team that needs professional services can't really describe what they're doing with the money that they've contributed, because it all went into this pot. A team lead can say, well, it helps the whole program, but of course a manager naturally wants to know, well, what's it done for me? What's it done for my team? So we're in the process of moving toward a packaged services model. Each team can choose from a menu of services with fixed prices and pay for them as they go, issue their own POs as they need to. No more single bucket of professional services. Uh, no need for me to corral budgets from 15 different finance and business managers. So, um, Oh yes, and the, the, uh, the, the third thing is we're, uh, at, least on a, at least for a while, we're going to try uh, having an in-house Acrolinx expert sit in a Google office part-time to help us manage the entire program. This will mean I can take the load off of me and the other leads for the hands-on work. We'll have an expert right there who can, who can take care of, care of things a lot more quickly than we can ourselves. Because we're using an, you know, our own server, we have to, do, we have to be hands-on. So far, Acrolinx hasn't been able to be hands-on with our server. Now that will change. We'll still have our 20% group, but they can begin to focus more on strategic issues rather than the day-to-day -day, um, support costs. So all of this means we can keep building value. Remember the moon shots? We can keep uh, the roof shots. We can keep building value and building momentum. And keep zigzagging toward the moon. That's it. Thank you.